What's good, YouTube? Big Fifty TV here. Today we're gonna be reacting to making a case for Larry Bird to be the goat. And before we get into the video, as always, like, comment, subscribe, and let's get into it. Basketball is special. The size of the court and the lack of pads or helmets give fans the most intimate experience of a team sport that exists. And because of the different styles that basketball allows for, players develop their own distinct identities and signature styles through their creativity, flair, and athleticism. And although no player succeeds alone, the scoring volume and two-way nature of the sport give individual stars a nearly yeah. unprecedented amount of control over the flow and outcome of a game. For this reason, players are constantly compared to their peers and to the legends of the past in order to answer the most hotly contested question in the sport. Who's the greatest to ever do it? For many, the question is redundant. They believe in only one right answer, their answer. Others might have their own personal stance, but acknowledge one or two alternatives. But I believe that there's much more nuance to the question of greatness and more answers to it than you might think. By my count, there are eight players in NBA history that have a substantial claim as the GOAT. It's a subjective thing though. I can't give you a definitive answer. All I can do is make the argument. So today, I'll be making the case for Larry Bird as the greatest basketball player of all time. When it comes to basketball, Larry Bird is the smartest, clutchest player to ever play the game. Now, if you don't think that Larry Bird is the greatest basketball player of all time, you probably hate that I just said that. Those are the kind of talking head sport cliches that surely impact the game but are impossible to empirically measure. Normally, I'd agree with you, but I think that when you talk about Larry Bird, you see those intangibles become real, palpable results. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't believe it. When Larry Bird was drafted by the Boston Celtics in 1978, the NBA needed saving. Attendance was in the toilet, the league had few marketable stars, cocaine addiction had several players in its grasp, and most damning of all, playoff games were being tape delayed. Playoff games at the highest level of basketball were being put in the back seat for black... Oh, for a second. Crackhead, so many NBA players. In the chokehold? <laughs> I know they wouldn't have played if there was a team to crack. Black and white delay. Playoff is in its grasp, and most damning of all, playoff games were being tape delayed. Playoff games at the highest level of basketball were being put in the back seat for black and white movies and network reruns. But rather than join the Celtics after being taken third overall, Larry Bird decided to return for his final year at Indiana State, a decision that would prove to be one of the most important in the history of the sport. Bird's final year saw the Sycamores tear through college basketball, going 33-0 before the national championship game. Bird, already claimed by the NBA's most historic and prestigious franchise, had established himself as the generational talent who would inherit the mantle of pro basketball. Indiana State's opponent in the national championship was Michigan State, captained by the immortal Irvin Magic Johnson. The Sycamores lost the championship to the more talented Spartans in the highest rated game in the history of basketball at any level still to this day. The stage had been set. The next decade of basketball would be defined by the rivalry between the white hick from French Lick and his Boston Celtics and the black Magic and his Showtime Lakers. The rivalry between Bird and Johnson is entwined into the fabric of the NBA and is worthy of a hundred documentaries. In this video though, we're going to be looking at Bird's claim of supremacy. Here's Bird's basketball resume. His three championships come with- Big time in all NBA team. Same. 10 year perhaps the highest collective degree of difficulty of any player's championships. His three MVPs came consecutively, making him only the third player to accomplish the feat, along with Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. His two finals MVPs are misleading. He was absolutely the best player on the 81 Celtics, but he was only a sophomore, and his 15 points per game in the finals gave the media an excuse to exact a little vengeance on a legendarily difficult interview. His all-star and first-team selections also come with the caveat that Bird only played for 13 seasons and missed all but six games of the 89 season following surgeries on both feet. Right. I can hear you already. 
A 13-year career, and this guy is supposed to be the goat? What color of paint are you huffing, Clayton? <laughs> Green, obviously. But hear me out. Yeah, Bird's career lasted about two-thirds as long as it should have. But what he did in that time was so impressive and so substantial that every basketball fan acknowledges that he's in the conversation as the greatest ever. Doesn't it matter that those 13 years saved professional basketball, delivered a disproportionate amount of memorable moments, defined the golden age of the league, and produced a career by which all other forwards, before or since, are measured? Bird squeezed every drop of talent out in those 13 years and made it seem more like 30. He didn't just leave his fingerprints on the game. He left so much of his DNA in the sport that it needed a cigarette afterwards. There's something to be said about the candle that lasts half as long but burns twice as bright. Those three MVP years stack up with any other run by any other player. I will put an A-plus Larry Bird season up against anyone's. What does an A-plus Larry Bird season look like? A full box score, a blowout win, a nearly undefeated record at home, and a play style that could only be described one way, white. Larry Bird isn't just a white basketball player, he's the white basketball player. To describe Larry Bird's game is to He's definitely an underrated passer, bro. For sure. Not many people can pass like that, man, bro. Can y'all look at these passes, bro? I'm going to think so. Only be described one way, white. Larry Bird isn't just a white basketball player, he's the white basketball player. To describe Larry Bird's game is to thumb through the hoops dictionary and pick out every cliche about white players. Unathletic, great shooter, good fundamentals, the whole thing. The archetype of a white basketball player is Larry Bird, with one exception. He had an unparalleled understanding of the game of basketball both as a physical contest and as a mental competition. His basketball IQ infected everything he did and catapulted his career into legend. Bird was a complete player. Jerry West called him nearly as perfect as you can get. He was the league's first great marksman. He could contort his body to shoot from anywhere on the court regardless of the level of defense. He pioneered the art of the Dagger 3 and was the founding member of the 50-40-90 club. At six foot nine, I did not know that he's a founder of the 50 40 90 club. If he's starting clubs, why isn't he better than MJ or LeBron? Food for thought. Bird's understanding of angles and coordination led to a higher rebounding average than Patrick Ewing, and it made him an impressively adept finisher in his younger years. In 86, Bird dropped 47 points on the Blazers, playing the majority of the game left-handed. His lack of quick lateral movement meant that Bird didn't do much when it came to slapping the floor and picking up the opposing point guard, but his size and omniscience gave him the ability to body similarly sized players, read defenses like a free safety, and pick off passing lanes with ease. His passing was transcendent, and I'll highlight it later. And of course you need to know that Larry Bird was a tough M effort. <laughs> Basketball is back. Watch the action live on a variety of networks, plus at NBA. He had a superhuman motor and dove for loose balls like a beagle at the park. He was a willing participant in his share of fights, often precipitated by his league-renowned trash talk. Robert Reed. Did he just throw a punch? Oh, man. Fights, often precipitated by his league-renowned trash talk. Oh. Leverett told Robert Reedy to have stayed there. He should have stayed in preaching. <laughs> that was funny. He had 50 points. I was guarding him my rookie year. He looked at me and he goes, you can't stop me. And I looked at him and I said, gosh, boy, you're, you're so confident. He proceeded to score like 10 straight points on him. Yeah. Coach oh. took me out the game. He walks by and he's laughing at me. <laughs> he was a basketball genius. He'd be a step yeah. ahead, uh, a thought ahead. Uh, play the game like a chess game. I'd much rather guard Michael Jordan than Larry Bird because you have to play the game as a thinker when you're playing him. You have to get inside his mind. If you put all of us in a room, you know, Magic, Jordan, myself, and Bird, Bird probably be the guy who walks out of the room at the end of the day. 
Did you notice something during those testimonies? Those are some of the best basketball players of all time, and they all sing Bird's praises like they were former assassins who had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Wick and they're just happy to be alive. Bird excelled during one of the most talent-rich periods in league history. The abridged list of his basketball rivals goes like this. Dr. J and Moses Malone on the Philadelphia 76ers, Sidney Moncrief on the Milwaukee Bucks, Isaiah Thomas, Bill Lambeer, and the Bad Boy Pistons, Dominique Wilkins on the Atlanta Hawks, Bernard King on the New York Knicks, Michael Jordan on the Chicago Bulls, Hakeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson on the Houston Rockets, and of course, Magic Johnson, James Worthy, and Kareem. Sorry guys, you hear um, a lawnmower in the background, somebody mowing their lawn. Abdul Jabbar on the Los Angeles Lakers. All right, there's no point avoiding it any longer. We have to look at Magic versus Larry. If you have Magic over Larry, it's because he has five rings to Larry's three, had a peak that lasted about two or three years longer than Larry's, and had a two and one record against Bird Celtics in the finals. Perfectly legitimate, completely respectable arguments. But in the interest of making Bird's case, allow me to retort. For nearly the entire decade of the 1980s, the Eastern Conference was irrefutably the more competitive conference between the two. Considering the competition, for Bird to have made five finals appearances is just as impressive as Magic's nine. As for the head-to-head -head record responsible for Magic's two extra titles, he had more help. Seriously, the Celtics' big three and the Lakers' big three get compared all the time historically as if they were of equal caliber, but weren't Magic's accomplices just a step above Bird's? No disrespect at all to Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, but Kareem was the alpha dog on the 71 bucks and was the best player for at least two of the Lakers' five titles. Hey. James Worthy was the number one pick out of UNC after winning a championship as the best player on a team that had Michael Jordan on it. Throw in the fact that Magic got to be coached by Pat Riley, one of the most brilliant minds in basketball history, and you could say that the Magic Bird argument comes down to one thing, luck. So if their careers come down to luck, the question just becomes who you would rather take. Now, I'm not making this video to tell you why you shouldn't take Magic. I'm making this video to tell you why you should take Bird. Not just over Magic, but over everybody. One thing that helps him is the fact Me personally, I definitely take Larry Bird over Michael Jordan, especially because of offense. And he couldn't pass as good as Magic, but he could pass, but he way better offensively. Taking, I'm taking Larry Bird. Why you should take Bird, not just over Magic, but over everybody. One thing that helps him is the fact that his play would translate perfectly into the league today. A six foot nine sharp shooting forward with eyes in the back of his head who averaged double digit rebounds in an era against Moses and Lambeer. He'd gobble up boards as a power forward. He'd be an offensive mismatch against everybody as a small ball center and his off ball skills and passing would pair perfectly with the flow of today's game. Add in his competitive mania and three generations worth of medical advancements, and we're talking about a player who could have stuck around so long they would have had to rename the league. As you've been watching these clips of Bird, I would hope that you would notice something. He always knows where everybody is. Watching Bird play basketball is like watching those monsters from a quiet place that know where you are if you make any noise at all. Bird had a level of clairvoyance that bordered on the unnatural. In 85, he ended up one steal away from a quadruple double after playing just the first three quarters. His passing was famously infectious and helped transform the Celtics of the 80s into an ideal that basketball teams at all levels are still shown tape of. They moved the ball with precision and intent, always looking for better shots and determined to get the entire team involved in the effort. That fact is almost entirely attributable to Bird and his wizardry with the ball. This acumen also helped Bird become the only player with a GOAT claim to transition successfully into other basketball roles after his playing career. In his three years as the head coach of the Pacers, Bird won a Coach of the Year award, coached the Pacers to their first and only finals appearance, and gave Michael Jordan as much trouble as he'd ever gotten in his career in the 98 Eastern Conference Finals. After moving into a front office role for Indiana, he won Executive of the Year in 2012, becoming the only person to have an MVP, Coach of the Year, and Executive of the Year. I did not know Larry Bird was a head coach. I knew he was in the executive office now for the Pacers, but I did not know he was a head coach before. Learn something new. Warrior. On the court or off of it, inside and out, Larry Bird sees basketball as only he can. That intelligence also lent itself to Bird's defining skill, 
making the big plays. Remember, NBA players get paid to win games. James Harden is getting paid nearly $40 million this year because he's supposed to help the Rockets win games. Victory can be achieved in a lot of ways, and the win column doesn't care how it happens. Yeah. As Mark Sinclair once said, It don't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning's winning. But when your team is down one in a crucial playoff game with eight seconds left, and you need to hit a shot to stay in the series and keep your season alive, that's where players really separate themselves and earn their money. Love it or hate it, it's the players that come through in the big moments that live forever in our memories. Some players, for whatever reason, were never able to do it consistently. Some players were truly outstanding at it. Larry Bird was the best at it. I'm not going to give you the stats about his field goal shooting under two minutes with a score that's this close or tell you who has the most buzzer beaters or any of that. Take that for data. I'm just going to show you clutch moments in clutch situations. 1985 against the Blazers. Bird drops 48 points, including this. Down one with two seconds left. The inbound pass, the double team in Bird. Larry, fake, fall away. Hit it! Who people up? You ain't passed next. LeBron would have passed that. Two people, and you tell me you don't pass that to the wild man. You take a shot because you know you just that confident that you're going to make it. Nineteen eighty five against the Hawks. Bird sets the Celtics scoring record with sixty points with shots like these. They open the right side. Bird the follow away. He oh. rolls it again. Oh, that's the best shooting. Nineteen eighty six against the Rockets. Not all of Bird's clutch moments were singular. The bigger the moment, the bigger his performance. In Game 6 of the 1986 oh, NBA look. Finals, Bird clinches the championship with a triple-double in what he calls the best game he ever played. Two seconds on the shot clock, Bird wants a three out of it. 1987 against the Washington Bullets. Bird hits one shot to tie it before it's waved off because of a timeout. Hits another shot to tie it up for real. Crowd is standing up. It goes now to Bird. Bird goes up top. And then in double <laughs> overtime, down one, he does this. Uh, it's going to go to Bird. He's huh? going to Get it. Get it. That man playing around with these folks, man. Do y'all see he shot those clutch shots off one foot? It's great. He does this. Uh, it's going to go to Bird. He's got a shot. Get it. For three years, from 1986 to 1988, the three-point contest knew no other champion but Larry Bird. Still gonna drop one here quickly, 14. This three. is a tie three for the money. Contest. Yo! Larry Bird! 1987 Eastern Conference Finals, Game 5. Tied at two games apiece against the Bad Boy Pistons, this enormous game would put the winner one game away from the NBA Finals. The Pistons are up one with seconds remaining. The ball goes out of bounds off the Celtics. Isaiah Thomas just needs to inbound the ball to win the game. Now that's a steal by Bird. the DJ Oh, one second left. What a play by Bird. Bird stole the inbounding pass. There are truly too many big games and big moments for me to go through without this ending up as a documentary. But that all leads me to this, what I really want to talk about. Hey, that, hey, that post work was insane, bro. That post work was it. <laughs> Let me go crazy. Without this ending up as a documentary. But that all leads me to this, that what I really work. want to talk about. 1987, NBA Finals. Game four against the Lakers. LA is up two games to one, and the Celtics need to win to tie. Be silent. Bird hits a three with 12 seconds left to go up by two. Bird goes for three. How many clutch? How many clutch shots does he really have? I wonder how many clutch shots he really has. Kareem comes down and gets fouled with eight seconds left. He makes the first. Yeah, ball here. <laughs> but misses the second. Oh. LA ends up with the ball with seven seconds left, down one point. In the low post, being guarded by Dennis Johnson. Byron Scott is in the ball game now. 
Magic hits this, the baby skyhook. Two. two seconds left. Grizzly. Down one. Dennis Johnson on the inbound. Bird fires it. What do you think happens? Uh, I bet it wasn't that. When I paused the tape and the ball was hanging in the air, you thought it was going in. Bird thought it was going in. Magic thought it was going in. I've seen this game before, and I still think it's going to go in. But it didn't. Pat Riley said it himself. We got lucky. And that, a missed shot in the NBA Finals is why he's the clutchest. Because after he makes the big plays, has the big games, hits the big shots, time and time again, you expect him to hit every shot, to win every game. And in those fleeting moments when he doesn't, when he looks like a mere human, when he looks like everyone else who tries to do what he does, you just can't believe it. That's what Larry Bird did. He made the big plays so often, you thought he was gonna make them every time. He helped turn basketball into a global phenomenon, paving the way for every Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or LeBron James who comes through our lives. He played basketball in its purest form and captained a team that is consistently ranked among the greatest of all time. He has the second highest win percentage in the history of the NBA, yeah. behind Magic by less than one half of 1%, about 10 games. He was the complete package, a player with no holes in his game whatsoever. They called him Basketball Jesus. But I wonder if he didn't hurt his back, what kind of damage he would have did to the NBA. He still did damage, but he had back problems. I just wonder what he would have did, bro. Definitely. He didn't get that name without doing something extraordinary. He saved basketball. And he did it by playing it better than anyone else. Here's Magic at Bird's retirement in 1993. Larry Bird said that there will be another Larry Bird one day. And Larry, there will never, ever, ever be another Larry Bird. To uh, the greatest basketball player ever, but more important, a friend forever. Magic called him the GOAT. He didn't say Jordan. He didn't say Jordan was GOAT. He said, Magic, out of his mouth, said Larry Bird is the greatest basketball player ever. Out of his own mouth. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. This was a really fun video to make and I'm going to continue to make more of them. So please feel free to subscribe. Alright guys, that's the end of the video. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Keep dropping recommendations down in the comments. And we out.